618 in Trinidad and Tobago. Good to have you with us as we get into the thick of things in the middle of your business on this Wednesday. And certainly the issues uh, facing the labor movement are very much at the forefront given uh, the situation with the economy, uh, more or less reconfirmed by the finance minister, different perspectives on it. We heard from the joint trade union movement yesterday and uh, concerns being expressed about uh, the issue of, of delayed payments, about people going to get paid in bonds and, and so many other matters. Well, we have with us uh, the, the secretary of the joint trade union movement. Of course, he's also an executive member, chief, ex chief education and research officer of uh, the the Oilfield Workers, uh, Oilfield Workers Trade Union, Ozzy Warwick uh, here with us. Uh, very good morning to you, Ozzy. Good, good to morning. have you on uh, the program. Well, I, he's struggling with the flu, uh, not, <laughs> not, not, not coping particularly well. And, and in fact, uh, another guest, Ram Kumar Narayan Singh of the Steel Workers Union is, is unwell. Um, is it that um, the, the economic situation <laughs> I, I is taking a toll? <laughs> you, you're, you're all buckling <laughs> under, under the, under the, the That's strain? That's a toll and you'll see us fighting, fighting. Um, are, are you giving the, the PNM an easy ride, by not, the way? Not at all, not at all. And I think all the actions and statements we would have made over the last six months are clear that we have not been giving them, um, it's not about giving anybody an easy ride. And I just want to state very categorical um, in terms of the JTUM, we met several times really discussing and analyzing this midterm review. And what we felt is that what you're seeing is the inequitable sharing of the burden of adjustment. Because we, last year, right here on this same program, we did an analysis of the state of the economy. So we actually did not wait for some central bank governor or even the minister of finance to tell us that we're in economic difficulties. We could feed it on the ground. And so we did an analysis. We actually held a conference of shop stores and branch officers on the state of the economy. And what we analyzed and said is, listen, in this economic difficult uh, times, what we need is to share the burden of adjustment. And therefore, we need to be engaged. Uh, we need to bring all the stakeholders together, build a consensus on how we collectively can share this burden of adjustment in order to come out of the crisis. We even stated back then, which is last year, that what we want is to grow our way out of the crisis. We need to increase production. We were the ones who said we need to increase productivity, increase production in order to grow our way out of the crisis rather than cut our way out of the crisis. And what we saw in the midterm review really was an inequitable sharing of the burden of adjustment. Elaborate on, on what, right. what specific areas well, are of concern. What we looked at is the amount of concessions and tax holidays for the business community. And the question we have to ask ourselves, we have had or the Minister of Labor, who has been working very hard, of course, but about three weeks ago stated there have been about 5,000 retrenchment notices. And that's notices. And we found out that employers are now asking employees to sign letters of resignation so they don't have to, to give notice of retrenchment. So which means thousands of workers have lost their jobs, including the ArcelorMittal uh, workers. Uh, we've had workers having their wages not uh, which is frozen. You saw the NGC situation. So in other words, workers are actually already bearing the burden. So the question is, okay, let's see what the midterm review has to say as to how other sectors are going to bear the burden. And what we saw is the concessions and tax holidays, expanded concession, for example, for the private sector in terms of um, the construction of multi-story car parks and commercial. Now it's expanded to residential. Um, houses. But isn't that going to provide jobs? If, but if, if, let, let's, let's take it from the point of view of, of the finance minister. By providing these holidays and these incentives, would that not create an environment where the business community will have less of a, of a reason or an excuse to lay off people, that they would in fact be incentivized to increase but productivity? But that, that's not our issue. Our issue is what would their sacrifice be? It cannot be that in a time of recession that the, 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 the small elite are going to maximize profit out of a recession on the backs of workers, at the sacrifice of workers. It is that inequity, is that, is, that is what we are uh, referring to. And what incentives are there for, for example, they talk about a credit line um, for, money, for the manufacturing sector but didn't say anything about improving working conditions in these factories in terms of health and safety. In other words, they should have said, listen, we are going to offer this credit line. However, as a conditionality, we want to see improved working conditions within your factory. Make sure that you are up to the HSE standards. In other words, where and how are you sharing this burden? At the moment, it is only workers and the poor carrying this. Making it worse is the fact that there have been no consultation, Fasil. 
and this has been our issue from the get-go. But, but because mm -hmm. we ahead, said, sorry. in order for us to grow out of this crisis, in order for us to discuss how we all share in this burden of adjustment, there needs to be an engagement with the key sectors. And one mechanism that would have been launched by the Prime Minister himself on the 15th of March was the, the Tripartite tri tri Advisory Con Council, yeah, advise the Council yeah. which met three days before the budget was being read. That is unacceptable. It is absolutely unacceptable because you have a mechanism by which you can build the necessary consensus between labor, government, and business in order for us to agree on how we all chip in. It cannot be that you have, whilst discussions are happening, workers are the sa only sacrificial lambs. That's the point, the only sacrificial lambs. And we are not hearing from the business community, okay, what will our sacrifice be? For example, you talk about increasing jobs, an incentive could have been, and we right here in, on this program, we stated that as a proposal, increase the corporate tax, and you can get a tax rebate on that if you can show that you are increasing jobs or if you're invested in research and development. And in that way, you're able not only to create jobs, but you are able to improve on innovation so that we can have more product, products to go to, to, to market and therefore earn more foreign exchange. The yes, other so, issue... Yeah, sorry, okay, go ahead with the other issue, yes. The other issue is the question of the diesel subsidy. I, I can't not speak about that. Right. That is where the grave inequity comes, because at the end, it is the poor, the working people, and the vulnerable who are going to feel the massive impact of that. Just three days ago, I went to buy an orchard orange juice, and you know what the lady in the shop said? Good thing you buy it now, because when next you come again, it's going to go up. That's orchard. So I'm thinking of the single mom or the single dad who have two kids, have rent, um, earning five to six hundred dollars a week, and I'm thinking, what is going to happen if that's just orchard? And she says, so I asked her, how much is it going to go up by? From $5 to $6. Where is the mechanism? How do you check? How do you determine? How, on what basis are these price increases? So when you think about the fiasco of the VAT scenario, where the, the, the attempt was to reduce VAT, that was a fiasco. Because in the end, all the businesses did, they all raised their prices. And now with the But diesel, isn't that, as you were, isn't that a failure of the regulatory agencies, consumer affairs and so on, to check? Because we actually had the, the you talk about a farcical situation yeah. of consumer affairs putting out a notice when and what time they're going to check on what grocery uh, uh, to check their prices. It, it, it's a, you know what it is? It's a complete failure of our institutions. And we have argued over and over and it's going to get worse when we realize these aging post-colonial institutions, they no longer are relevant and they can no longer meet the needs of ordinary citizens. But it is working work, against us. Can subsidies, subsidies and transfers to the extent that we continue to do it in Trinidad and Tobago, can that be justified in a modern economic environment? Yes, that is justified in the absence, because when you talk about a modern economic environment, a modern economic environment also presupposes that you have a very strong, comprehensive social protection system in place. So if you take, for example, because we like to use those models in... in Why in should we continue with a dependency syndrome? Why should we no, continue to have people depending on the state for all sorts of handouts? No, I don't think it's a question of dependency or handout, because first of all, that's a very paternalistic way of view of looking at it. Let us look at it from this angle. The natural resources of this country, none of us put it there. We came and we met it there. We were, we were lucky. We were born in the Twin Island Republic that has this resource. So how do all of us benefit? Not some, not a few, not just corporations. How do ordinary citizens benefit from a natural resource that, a, that is in um, our land? And one way to do that, one mechanism to do that, is through subsidies. The other way to do it is if you put in place a strong social protection uh, uh, system in order to in order to ensure that the poor, the vulnerable, and the working and working people have opportunities in which to improve their quality of life. Isn't and that isn't that a dis in the, disincentive to productivity? Uh, oh, I, quite I, to the con au contraire, because uh -huh. where we look at countries that has such a system in place, they are some of the most productive countries in the world: Denmark, Norway, Sweden, just to name a few, who have very, very strong, very, very strong social protection systems in place. So. Our argument is not so much that we must continue forever with the subsidies. Our argument is a philosophical one. How do we ensure that all citizens can benefit from a system put in place, the economic system, but also the social protection system, to ensure that all citizens have a 
fairly good standard of living. And, I, and that is, in other words, that is how do we construct a fair, just society. What we have is an unfair society, an unjust society, where a few, the 5%, continue to um, um, amass huge amounts of wealth, and the poor, working people, and the vulnerable are left to bear the burden of adjustments when there is economic difference. One of the accusations laid at the feet of the union movement is that it seems very convenient to demonize the business class, when many people in the business class say that we were, the, we were once poor and disenfranchised, and we worked damn hard to, to earn what we have to build the business that we have, but it seems that we're almost being either penalized or demonized or, or characterized as being those who, who suck off the, 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 the wealth of the land at the expense of the, of the poor man. And, and they will, many of them will put forward the, 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 the point of view that they were once among the, 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 the so-called underclass, but just worked extremely hard to improve themselves. Why are they punished for that? I don't think it's a question of punishment. You see, once you have a system that is based on inequality and inequity, there will always be the situation where you have an elite few that are benefiting from the many. I'm not saying that it didn't work hard, but so too the single mom and single father who has to get up 3 a.m. to ensure that their kids are ready for school and have to face the traffic. They work very hard as well. And the point is... How so how do you do change we... that? Okay, so we're talking about system. Well, I how... think it's a question of how do we change the economic power relations. That is what we have to change. In other words, how do we empower, how do we create more um, in, uh, uh, autonomy for workers within the workplace so that they can contribute. And for example, profit sharing is one example that you, we, we could look at, where you insensitize productivity. The other thing is we have to be able to change the laws, the labor laws, which labor laws were put in place in 1972, let us remind ourselves of that, yes. and were put in place for one purpose and one purpose only, which was to call workers into submission. We need to come out of that. We need to shift away from the colonial approach to a more enlightened approach where you have work people have in the power where they live and where they work. Do we have a workforce that is inclined to, to take advantage of an enlightened work environment? I believe we do. And I tell the evidence you doesn't that. suggest that, Ozzy Warwick. No, if I, you go in I the public think... sector, and I, I drew the reference oh, of, of <laughs> licensing. Yeah. Uh, where... You like to use that reference. No, of course, because, I mean, it, it affects everybody. Yeah, sure. The, the, mm. And, and, and right. the, the, the fact listen. of the matter is someone will say, well, they, we can't do nothing because the cashier ain't enough for work. And the, you, according to the union agreement, only cashiers could work by the cashier, nobody else. Mm -hmm. That, to, to, the, to the ordinary citizen, is a classic example of union regulations and structures designed to encourage lack of productivity. I disagree. That is an example of a post-colonial institutional structure that has not changed since 1962. That's the real fundamental problem. So, mm. for example, it is not an enlightened situation where you have the people given the opportunity to contribute to how things can be improved. And I can tell you, if you speak to ordinary public servants on the ground, who came into the, they will tell you, you know, they have, they came in there with so many ideas on how to improve things and how to make it easier. But you know what happens? When those proposals and suggestions, which came, comes from ordinary public servants who have really this enthusiasm to make things better, when that goes up the chain, you realize the structure does not support it. That is the fundamental issue. So you can um, change the people, if you will, but so long as you don't change the institutional structure of the state. And these are ev examples of a collapse, a post-colonial institutional structure. Time doesn't allow us for, to even know, develop I that still, philosophical discussion because we really would need more time to do that. But I in, just in, want one... Sorry, yeah, yeah. In, what, in the few minutes that we have, that's what I was going to ask you. What are the labor movement? What is the labor movement prepared to do now? Okay. What are you so, all mobilizing well, to do all right, in so, relation to the aftermath of that half-year yeah. presentation? All right, but I just allow me, I have to say this in 15 seconds, sure, agriculture. Sure. Yeah. I, I can't sit here as JTOM secretary and not talk about agriculture and the fact that no mention was made as to how to increase local production, food production, by supporting local farmers. Especially when there's so much that. talk about food security. I just had to say that. Mm. So, so just um, thank you for that few <laughs> seconds <laughs> no problem. to be able to speak on behalf of the small farmers. Um, what next? We are mobilizing. Uh, second of May, in the streets of San Fernando, we'll be mobilizing, 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 because we believe um, this is, at the end of the day, power lies in the streets. Okay? That is a, f a point of view of CLR James, and we hold to that. 
will be mobilizing because we cannot continue to have retrenchments and no emergency legislation being put in place to protect the workers. There is something the government can do. They can make an emergency intervention. If you recall, um, in the last corrupt government, and I have to say that, the last corrupt government, they passed Section 34 in blink of an eye for, to benefit a few. So we're saying let us also put in place emergency legislation, not to protect a few, but to protect the tens of thousands of hard working Trinbagonians. But based so on what you heard from the finance minister, do you anticipate that the government will even be inclined to look in that direction of emergency legislation? And that is why we are mobilizing for the 2nd of May, Fassi. And uh, when, we, when you talk about that, that mobilization, and, and you, you mentioned the Tripartite Council, we still have a couple of minutes left. Uh, okay, Aussie. good. What is your, do you have faith in this tripartite advisory council, do you actually believe, after all the pomp and fanfare of the opening and so on, which also cost taxpayers dollars to have it, by the way, uh, but do you actually have any faith or confidence or hope that it could actually work to, okay. to reorientate the situation? I, um, I, I believe in hope. I believe that as a people, we must have hope. That is so critical because a society that falls into hopelessness leads to anarchy. And I, I also want to say that the last administration, after ripping this country apart, the only way to pull it back together was through a mechanism by which you can have business, labor, and government around the table building consensus on how we build Trinidad and Tobago and grow our way out of the economic crisis. I still believe that there is the possibility for us to build that necessary consensus. However, what we will not accept is bringing us around the table to have a discussion to build this consensus whilst you're sacrificing workers outside. We cannot accept that because that means we are having a discuss discussion on bad faith. You know, um, in, in conflict situations, when you are having the negotiations for peace talks, you have a ceasefire. Yes. We want a ceasefire on retrenchment. Ozzy Warwick, thanks very much for joining us. Good Thank to get you. to your perspective. Very forthright and straightforward, as always. And he said they're mobilizing in San Fernando on uh, May the 2nd, the day after May Day, uh, to talk about and highlight the many issues uh, related to the inequity as is perceived in relation to the working class in Trinidad and Tobago. We'll take a break. Notice he didn't struggle with the flu when he was uh, uh, basically ex extolling all of the issues uh, that have been raised. Uh, and, and certainly uh, the, these are issues that uh, will get you out of your sick bed, especially if you, you are in the labor movement. We'll be back right after this talking with the Automotive Dealers Association.